This week on Goofing Off. Ghouls. Drew talks about a lesser known Keel Annie classic. Ghouls. Nick brings back a classic segment. Ghouls. Cameron dives into the world of D&D. All this and more on Goofing Off. Welcome back to another semester of the one, the only, goofing off. I am Caleb Morgan. And I'm Becca Tyler. Wait, Becca, I, th I thought you went back to the void after your hosting career finished. Um, how do you have, like, corporal form? Well, Caleb, it's kind of simple, actually. I bought a ticket in the void to come back here, and now here I am. Oh, um, okay, I guess. Uh, so we're the hosts. Um, what segment should we introduce first? I don't know, uh, how about we start things off with Mr. Colin Long taking on a new segment this semester with Face Off. Okay. Hey fellas, this is Colin, and since Kyle has made his glorious exit from this university and eventually this country, I figured I would take up his mantle and compare and contrast two games while deciding which game is superior in a segment we like to call Face Off. Usually we like to cover two games within the same genre that are heavily compared to one another, reboots compared to their original counterparts, or sequels. So in this case, I'll be comparing two games that introduce an iconic character in two radically different ways, with each telling entirely different narratives while encompassing almost everything we love about the franchise. For this episode, I will see how the original God of War stacks up against this later entry of the same name and decide which of the two introduces Kratos in the most profound and entertaining fashion. In 2005's God of War, we were introduced to Kratos for the first time as his deeds and eternal sins were laid bare in his obsessive conquests of Greece while leading the Spartan army. Unfortunately, in a brief moment of weakness in which his life was at stake, Kratos was forced to call upon Ares for assistance in exchange for eternal servitude. It was through this process that Kratos was gifted the iconoclastic chain blades and was able to gain the upper hand. Afterwards, Kratos slaughtered his way through all of Greece in Ares' name while further alienating himself from his wife and child. In this endless conquest, Kratos unwittingly slaughters his own family after being tricked by Ares. After having done the unforgivable, the village oracle fuses his family's ashes to his skin, thereby earning him the moniker of Ghosts of Sparta. God of War was a welcome addition in the hack and slash genre, popularized by the Devil May Cry franchise in the early 2000s, and the genre fit perfectly inside the world of ancient Greece. The stunning locales were also a great benefit, as we hacked and slashed everywhere from Athens, Pandora's Temple, while it was being carried by Kronos, and even Hades. It being a hack and slash game, the combat above all else has to succeed, and Santa Monica delivered in spades. Even almost 15 years later, the combat feels fluid and ultimately timeless. The combos feel as satisfying as ever, even while sticking with the tried and true square square triangle, and what helps bring the combat to even bigger heights are the boss battles and the overall spectacle of the game's aesthetic. God of War lets you know exactly what kind of game it is from the very beginning, as Kratos is forced to kill a Hydra that threatens to sink his ship. And although it's a tired mechanic nowadays, the quick time events that capped off every boss battle always resulted in Kratos finishing them off in the most over the top and gruesome way possible. Even the combat animations still hold up after all this time, but one problem that dogs this game and most of the franchise for that matter is that every attack feels weightless. As you thrust your blades halfway across the screen with relative ease and consistently clear out a room full of enemies, you feel like your attacks don't carry the impact that they should. It all feels almost too effortless for the protagonist regardless of how enjoyable the combat may be. Luckily, this is offset by expertly crafted puzzles that are a near constant presence in the game. The revenge-fueled plot is also more than serviceable for this game, but it causes Kratos to feel a little one note as a protagonist. While the circumstances that led to his servitude to Ares and his family's death is enough to make you get behind him as a character, Kratos doesn't initially appear to show much depth beyond that. Even some of the best revenge stories showcase a protagonist with some emotional range, but Kratos' rage is perpetual. Granted, it makes for entertaining over-the-top cutscenes and gameplay, but if not for the game's relatively short running time, Kratos' personality or lack thereof would begin to wear thin. Another issue that plagues this game are the fixed camera angles. Even though they help heighten the cinematic aspects and allow the player to view the frame in all of its glory, 
It's hardly practical for gameplay, especially when it zooms out during climbing and platforming sequences. That being said, God of War is still a great game 15 years later. Everything from the grand vistas of ancient Greece, the combo-focused combat, the fair but challenging puzzles, the revenge-fueled narrative, and the bombastic score that sits beneath it all still makes this game a must-play. But would the franchise manage to top itself 13 years later? Santa Monica developed and released the second God of War of the same name in April 2018. The fact it wasn't just called God of War 4 and its lack of a colon in the title was a clear announcement that this game was to serve as a second introduction to Kratos. While his temper remains, albeit in a smaller capacity, he's noticeably worse for wear this time around. Even if you haven't played the other games, you can sense that he has quite the history and is being weighed down by choices he's made and forces that are beyond his control. This time around, Santa Monica traded the ancient Greece setting for a Norse one instead, seeing that Kratos thoroughly decimated Greece after the events of God of War 3. Basically, Kratos fled to Scandinavia, got married, and had a son. Unfortunately, his wife passed, and he was left to raise their son alone, which is where we begin in this story. But Kratos eventually finds out that he traded one malevolent pantheon of gods and goddesses for another, as he and his son Atreus go on a journey to the highest peak in all the realms to spread the mother's ashes. This game obviously aims for a much different tone from every game before, as it tells a more intimate narrative about a grieving father struggling to raise his son and his struggle to not let his past affect the present. One thing that immediately jumps out at you is that the whole game runs on one, never breaking shot, allowing the cinematics and gameplay to almost be indistinguishable. Although it can appear gimmicky at first, you find that it serves to heighten the intimacy in most of the scenes, especially those where Kratos interacts with his son. Also, Kratos, for a time, no longer bears the chains of chaos, and instead uses the Leviathan Axe as his weapon of choice. The axe functions a lot like Thor's hammer Mjolnir, and it adds a lot of depth to the combat, as well as the puzzle solving. Unlike the first God of War, the combat is severely slowed down, and you can actually feel the weight of every attack and his movements. One more mechanic that was added to the combat is Kratos' son himself. At your behest, you can command Atreus to fire arrows from a distance, and throughout the game as he acquires more upgrades, Atreus becomes further well equipped to handle any encounter that comes your way. The mechanic is fun enough on its own, but the game uses these encounters to deepen the bond between Kratos and his son as he gives him pointers for reference later on. Although this God of War aims for a more intimate experience, the spectacle that we expect from this franchise is still here in all of its glory, especially in the boss fights. Like most of the combat, the boss fights aim for a more gruesome and intimate experience as opposed to the Hydra and Ares fights in the first game, but they are nonetheless visually spectacular, especially in the closing cinematics of each fight in which the quick time events are thankfully excluded. Lastly, where the first God of War was a strict linear experience, this one includes a hub area where you can explore the Lakes of Nine to either do side quests or solve various puzzles to acquire upgrades. The RPG elements don't stop there as you can swap armor pieces in and out, upgrade your axe, and wear various talismans that adds even more to the depth of gameplay. So between the God of Wars of 2005 and 2018, I would have to choose 2018. Although the original God of War is one of the best ever introductions to an iconic protagonist, I think the newer God of War does a better job of telling a compelling and profound narrative. The older Kratos is more introspective, thoughtful, and displays a much wider emotional range than the Kratos in the original game, and is overall a character with far more depth and dimension. The combat is more mindful and methodical with more mechanics and depth of gameplay that goes far beyond combos and button mashing. The one-shot camera creates a visual and cinematic experience unlike any other in gaming, outshining even the God of War games of old. God of War 2018 managed to totally reinvent the franchise and become a touchstone in the gaming landscape itself. And for that, I have to give 2018 the win here. Thanks for watching Face Off. Feel free to hit the like button down below, subscribe to the channel, and follow us on Twitter as ETV Goofing Off. See ya! Wait, game's on a budget. I haven't heard that name since. Since Drew did it like a million years ago. Yeah! Who's doing it now? Well, I mean, according to my notes that I have in my hand right here, I think new member Nick is taking on Goab and he's playing a game called. A, a Short Hike. Sounds cool. Well, you heard it from him, folks. Games on a Budget is up next.
Hi everybody, I am Nick McFadden and this is Games on a Budget. In this segment I will be reviewing games that cost less than $10 in hopes of providing you money savvy gamers with a couple of recommendations. Today we will be looking at the indie game made by Adam Guru, A Short Hike. In this open world casual game you play as the female bird named Claire. This game begins with Claire's mom dropping her off at Hawk Peak Providential Park to spend time with her Aunt May, who also happens to be a park ranger. One day, Claire is awaiting a call from her mom and becomes nervous when she hasn't received it. Her aunt explains that this is because there is no cell service in the park and the only place to get cell service is at the summit of Hawk Peak. This sends our character into action as you are thrust into the wonderful world of Hawk Peak Providential Park. Don't let this game's title fool you though, the journey to the top of Hawk Peak is no short hike. There's a few reasons for this. First being the controls are a little janky. It takes some time to get used to them and you might have to rebind your control keys. The second reason, and the main reason, is that this game was designed in a way where you can only progress through interacting with the environment around you. You have to acquire items called Golden Feathers in order to progress in this game. These feathers act as a way to increase your stamina bar, which allows you to climb higher up the trail to the summit. Locking parts of this park behind the feather threshold was a genius move by the game developers. This forces players to become immersed in the charming atmosphere of this little adventure. You can find feathers in three main ways. The first is by reaching challenging areas through pure exploration. There are a lot of jumping puzzles in this game and oftentimes you will be rewarded with a golden feather for figuring out these puzzles. The second way is by purchasing them. I know this sounds like the easy way out, but I will say one of my favorite interactions in this game was from a feather dealer who you meet about three fourths up the way of Hawk Peak Trail. The final and most common way is by doing favors for NPCs. There were many great NPC interactions in this game. One of my absolute favorite NPC encounters was the beach skipball side mission. In this little interaction, you are essentially playing volleyball with the NPC until you reach 10 hits between the two of you. I know this doesn't sound super exciting, but this mission really does immerse you in the game and makes you feel like you really are on a team with this NPC trying to reach the silly 10 hit goal. After failing this simple task several times, I finally got above 10 hits and was rewarded with a feather. This game does a great job of rewarding you for having fun, and this is something that is super refreshing to see in the current gaming industry. Another one of my favorite interactions in this game was with the local fisherman Bill. Learning to fish in this game is one of the most adorable moments of my whole playthrough. I couldn't get enough of my character impatiently asking, am I doing this right, before finally getting a fish to bite. An additional aspect of this game I enjoyed was the treasure hunts. Occasionally you find a treasure map that had a cryptic clue as to where a large amount of money could be found. I am a sucker for riddles and it was very satisfying to find where this treasure was buried. This game has enough content to keep you busy for a few hours, but if you are looking for a long game to keep you occupied for a while, this might not be for you. I would also be remiss if I did not talk about the amazing soundtrack to this game composed by Mark Sparling. The soundtrack perfectly captured the essence of this game and enhances the overall atmosphere of this chill adventure. If you did not get distracted by all the possible interactions or get lost in the amazing soundtrack and somehow manage to make it to the end of Hawk Peak Trail, you will be rewarded with a satisfying and beautiful conclusion to your adventure. A Short Hike is a simple yet elegant adventure worth every penny of its $7.99 price tag on Steam. Do you have any suggestions for cheap games to review? If so, please make sure you tweet at ZTV goofing off with hashtag GoAb. Until next time, I'm Nick Oh man, all right, it's break time. What kind of weird stuff are we gonna do for the break this time? I got it. We'll be right back. If you like what you see here on Goofing Off, be sure to like us on Facebook, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and follow us on Twitter. Hey, you piece of Akron After Hours is a show on ZTV. It is a sketch comedy show that makes people laugh. Ha, ha, ha. It is a fun, light-hearted time, and everyone on the show loves it. Just look at the producer. He loves every second of being on Akron After Hours. Be sure to keep up to date on all of the laughs this semester. When I first saw Turtle, my heart was full. Not anything but lonely. We had this like deep connection, this heart connection. He just wants to be close to you and part of your life. Every day with Turtle is a perfect day. He's an incredible companion and my best friend. When I'm holding her, it makes me feel calmer. It's a sensory thing. It's a thing with Asperger's. I've seen adults react to my daughter when she has meltdowns, like she's from a different planet. And this little animal just sat next to my child and was just like, you know, 
it's gonna be cool. When I retired from the Navy, I found myself in a void in my life that had been filled by the people that I served with. Tommy really brought an important factor to my life. I think everything he does shows how much he loves us. When we adopt a shelter pet, we discover they're a little bit of a lot of things. But they're all pure, pure love. love. You're watching ZTV. Oh, cool. With all new segments, I'm really glad to see at least one continuing. Let's see what Kyle has to say for us wait, on Anima. Wait, wait, Caleb. Kyle graduated last semester. Um, oh, oh, um, then, then who's, do, who's doing Animanga? Like, it says right there. See? Tell me, Becca. I'm curious. Okay, okay, okay. Let's just solve that mystery right now when Drew talks about Hyoka on Animanga. Oh, um, okay, I guess that's solved. Well, everyone, it's a brand new semester. Looks like Goofing Off has chosen that I stay in my loft apartment and review visual novels yet again. So that's what I'm gonna do. I'm Drew Brown, and this is Drew's Visual No- Wait, what? What's going on? Did the power go out? Come on, I already did Zero Escape. Me? But, but why? Uh, okay, Yui, but I'm not in the Animaga Funny Squares area, and I can't really do it without the Funny Squares. Uh, okay, well, I guess I'm reviewing anime now. So, I guess let's talk about one of my personal favorites. Here's Kyoto Animation's Hyoka. Everyone knows good old Kyo Annie, whether you know their classic works like The Melancholy of Haruhi Suzumiya or Lucky Star, or maybe some of their newer works like Violet Evergarden or Miss Kobayashi's Dragon Maid. Kyo Annie really has something for everyone, and that combined with their masterfully written and directed series that always has spectacular visuals that push the bounds of what television animation can do, makes them my personal favorite anime studio. Of course, in July of 2019, when Kyo Annie was hit with a horrible arson attack, I was devastated. I love their work so much, and it really hurt to see them suffer. As they recover, I decided that I would buy a Blu-ray or two from them and rewatch some of my favorites. I have a lot of favorites from them, but for this first episode of Animanga for the semester, I decided that I would talk about one of their lesser known works, Hyoka. Hyoka follows Oroki Hotaro as he begins his first year of high school. Oroki is a self-proclaimed energy conservationist, and he prefers to live his life in a more monochrome fashion as opposed to what the show calls a rosy colored life. He doesn't like doing anything that gets in the way of him not having to do something. He says many times in the show, now, because of Oroki's cynical nature, you probably think that he's a pretty bad, unlikable character, right? Well, you're wrong, but we'll get to that in a second. Hyoka also centers around three other characters, Satoshi and Ibura, who have been Oroki's friends since middle school. There's also Chitanda, who's the main girl of the show and a newcomer to the friend group from middle school. All four of them join the classic literature club and the show takes off from there. I like Hyoka a lot because it starts looking like it's going to be a same old, same old romance slice of life, but it's so much more than that. Once you hear that first, you know that something special is about to happen. Hyoka is a show about mysteries. Chitanda's curiosity always gets the best of her, and when she finds something that she wants to figure out, Oroki can't escape her grasp until the mystery is solved. Oroki ends up solving many mysteries for Chitanda, whether they be what her late uncle told her when she was small, to little things like why a middle school teacher liked helicopters so much. Oroki at first is very unwilling to solve these mysteries because of his energy-conserving lifestyle. But as the show goes on and Oroki spends more and more time with Chitanda and the others, he begins to question his own energy-conserving ways. My favorite part of Yoka is seeing Oroki develop more and more as a person. Kyo Annie did a wonderful job of building him up slowly with a constant pace throughout the series. And by the time you get to that final episode, you can tell just how far he's come. That isn't to say that the show overall isn't interesting as well. Each episode is packed with interesting plots and discoveries to be made. With each mystery, Kyo Annie took the time to even animate the scenarios in different styles to make them stand out to the viewer. They're always interesting and engaging to follow. A lot of them also reference or even based on the works of Sherlock Holmes and Agatha Christie. So if you like reading, you might get a kick out of that. A lot of times, I get a Monogatari vibe from the show. There's so much dialogue and cutaways during some of the interactions between characters, and some of the episodes don't even leave a single room. However, like in Monogatari, this isn't necessarily a bad thing. Oroki's crazy deductions and how he reaches them are what drives the show, and whether they leave a room or the whole episode is spent in the club room, it's still a very interesting watch. 
There's certainly a romance plot under the mystery of Hyoka as well. In the later episodes, you can tell that Chitana and Oroki have some sort of feelings for each other. However, the romance never steps above the mystery in order of importance. I'd say it's one part romance and three parts mystery. Satoshi and Ibura get some light too, of course, especially near the end. Satoshi is the playful friend who pushes Oroki to solve these mysteries and initially gets him to begin his journey to that rosy-colored high school life, and Ibra is pretty good too. Honestly, Ibra gets a lot more development around the second half, so I won't spoil anything. And of course, being a Kyoto Animation production, Hyoka is absolutely stunning to look at. It's such a simple looking anime, and that's what I love about it. How simple the characters are designed and how they interact, like Chitata's quick movements as opposed to Oroki's slow, sloth-like movements, really hit home the themes the show is trying to convey. And every time I see those big purple Chitanda eyes, I can't help but smile. It might look plain at a surface level, and it definitely doesn't have those crazy pink-haired waifus like the other shows, but I think that its simple art style does it wonders. While I'm talking about art, I might as well mention the soundtrack. Yoka's soundtrack is again, simple. However, I think it's very effective. Many of the songs have a unique instrumentation and are just generally cool to listen to. It's almost like the songs have a sort of mystery of their own. Overall, I think Hyoka is a great story of a special someone being able to bring the best out of someone else who might not know they're great in their own unique way. I really like that Hyoka's story is organized into arcs, but can also be looked back on as a whole and appreciated for everything that the group of friends did together, culminating to the final episode, which is one of my favorite final episodes in any anime I've seen. Hyoka is one of KyoAni's dark horses. Unlike shows like K-On or Chinibyu, which came out within the same couple of years as Hyoka, Hyoka doesn't get as much spotlight or talk generated about it. And I really don't think that this is fair because it's honestly one of the most well-directed and cleverly written from them. And while it can't top sound euphonium and K-On for me, it's definitely my third favorite from Kyoto Animation. And if you haven't figured it out yet, I really like Kyoto Animation. Hyoka originated as a novel written by Honobu Yonezawa. It was adapted by Kyoto Animation in 2012. The anime was written by Shoji Gato and directed by Yasuhiro Takamoto, who unfortunately passed away in the Kyoto Animation arson attack last year. So I'd like to thank Mr. Takamoto for directing one of the best animes from KyoAni and one of my favorite animes, period. On a happier note, Hyoka is one of the most finely crafted anime I've seen. Every second of it is packed with love and care. It was like my fifth anime, and after my recent rewatch, I can safely say that it still made me smile and brought me a lot of happiness. So I hope that you give it a shot and it brings you happiness as well, and hey, maybe you'll learn something about yourself too. Or maybe you'll just learn that you like solving mysteries with a cute purple-eyed girl. If Hyoka does either, I've done my job. Well, fellas, that was my first episode of Animanga. Hope it can live up to the legacy of everyone who's done it before me. I haven't inherited a segment like this in a while, so hope it was to your liking. If you are curious as to what I'll review next, tweet me at ZTVGoofingOff with that hashtag Animanga. Until next time, I'm Drew Brown, and I hope to solve more anime mysteries with you next time. Ready, we have to do something weird for the breaks. Here, let me go get something and I'll put it on. We'll be right back. <laughs> if you like what you see here on Goofing Off, be sure to like us on Facebook, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and follow us on Twitter. just wanted to talk to you about what happened with those two girls in eighth grade. Oh yeah. That one day at PE when they were like yelling at me and then you just linked arms with me. I don't think you know how much like that helped me because like I finally like knew that I had somebody. You're watching ZTV.
Becca, we finally got Joe. Who's Joe? Well, Becca, I've been I've been training for this moment my entire life. I've I've waited many years. Different opportunities have came and went, but oh, I've I've waited so long. I've, I've waited so long. <sighs> yeah, that's cool, but who is he? Joe Mama. Oh, cool. Here's Joe talking about some current gaming news on The Scoop. I'm Joe Goodman, and welcome to the very first episode of The Scoop, your source for gaming and other nerd-related news. Now, it's no secret that 2020 is going to be a huge year for gamers. This year is packed full of some great titles that are sure to go down in history, and with some brand new consoles from Microsoft and Sony coming in this holiday season. Both the PS5 and Xbox Series X are shaping up to be some major powerhouses and may even be on the same level as current PCs when it comes to hardware. The idea of finally getting new consoles after seven years is extremely exciting, but the wait might be too long. At least we have all the new great games coming out in the meantime, right? Right? Not exactly. Video games being delayed is nothing new, especially with the current generation of consoles. But lately, we've been getting hit pretty hard with them as it seems there's nothing but one delay after the other. This domino effect really started last year as many anticipated games were being pushed back to early or mid-2020. The first noteworthy game to be pushed back was Ubisoft's Skull and Bones. The game was first announced in 2017. However, it was then delayed in May of 2019 until sometime after March of this year. Not much has been revealed about the game's story or game mechanic, but we do know it's an action-adventure pirate game set in an open world for players to explore with friends on their very own pirate crew, similar to Microsoft's Sea, sea of Thieves, if not with a grittier style. Shortly after this came the heartbreaking news that the next installment of the beloved Animal Crossing series, Animal Crossing New Horizons, was delayed by Nintendo to around the same time of March 20th, 2020. The reason Nintendo gave for the delay was to help limit the crunch that the development team was under, which is something I respect. Doom Eternal, the sequel to the popular Doom reboot in 2016, was supposed to release late last year until id Software pushed the game back to the same date as Animal Crossing New Horizons. However, this new release date applies to all the versions except the one on no Nintendo Switch, which is still missing a confirmed release date. This next game that was delayed has been on the minds of PlayStation players for years. On October 24th, The Last of Us Part 2 was officially delayed by Naughty Dog. The Last of Us Part 2 has been a long-awaited game by fans with nothing more than rumors to go off of hoping for a sequel to the masterpiece that was The Last of Us. Part 2 was originally announced for a release date of February 21st, but just a few days after the news about Doom Eternal, we were hit with a delay until May 29th, making fans wait on the edge of their seats for a few months longer. With the first game finding itself as many people's game of the decade, this particular delay was tough on the fans. I don't know what it was about October 24th, but the very same day as we got news of The Last of Us being delayed, we got news of not one, not two, but three Ubisoft titles being delayed until sometime after April with no clear release date set. The first game was Ubisoft's Watch Dog Legion, which is the third installment in the franchise and has the unique gameplay mechanic that allows players to literally play as anyone they see in the game world. This game has been anticipated by the fans ever since its reveal. We don't know too much about the other two games that were delayed. However, we do know that Rainbow Six Quarantine is a three-player tactical shooter similar to Rainbow Six Siege, but instead of going head-to-head -head with other players in a 5v5 shootout, players are up against a threat that puts all of humankind at risk. Gods and Monsters is the third game delayed by the studio, where the player is on a quest to save the gods of the Greek Pantheon. Square Enix also put off two of its most anticipated games with their Final Fantasy VII Remake being pushed back from March 3rd to April 10th, and their Marvel Avengers game being delayed from May 15th to September 4th, putting it very close to my most anticipated game of the year, which I'll get to in a bit. Dying Light 2 wants the player's choices to actually have weight in the world, and so every choice made by the player shapes the world and the future of the post-apocalyptic landscape. Sadly, the developer Techland has not given any new release date for the game after the initial delay. The final game I'm talking about today is also my most anticipated game of the year, and maybe the decade. Cyberpunk 2077 is a first-person RPG made by CD Projekt Red, and according to them, will be their magnum opus, surpassing even The Witcher 3, which is the most awarded game in history. 
CD Projekt Red first announced the game in 2013 with a teaser trailer and have quietly been hard at work on the game since with an initial release date of April 16th. However, on January 16th, the developer put out the heartbreaking news that the game will be delayed until September 17th. I've waited seven years for this game to come out, so I guess I can wait five more months. That's a wrap for this episode of The Scoop. What games are you looking forward to? Tweet me at ZTV goofing off with the hashtag The Scoop. Tune in next time for more exciting gaming and nerd related news. Goof. See ya. All right, Caleb, I'm back with stuff for the brick. Caleb, this feels like break three. Don't tell me you went to break three. We'll be right back. If you like what you see here on Goofing Off, be sure to like us on Facebook, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and follow us on Twitter. I'll never forget the day our landlord called and said, read your lease. No pets allowed. My owner tells him my dog ate the lease, but that didn't work. And now I'm stuck in a shelter, but this pit bull is ready for a new crib. I'm loving, loyal, and play well with others. So don't be intimidated by all my muscles, because the biggest one I have is my heart. <laughs> That's right, I said it. Look at you. You're at the top of your game. You're unstoppable. Nothing can throw you off track. Wait, is that your car? Uh-oh. Yeah, I saw that coming. That will throw you off track. You're looking at around 10 grand in fines, legal fees, and increased insurance rates. Let's try this again. Smart move. Because buzz driving is drunk driving. You're watching ZTV. Good news, Caleb. Mitchell is back with ZT Rivia. Oh, awesome. Uh, what kind of subjects are you doing for this episode? Well, for this episode, there's a lot of uh, yelling, dragons, and uh, swords. Oh, he's doing Clifford the Big Red Dog? Yeah, he's doing Clifford the Big Red... Wait, what? No, he's doing Skyrim. Oh. Oh. Uh, here's Mitchell with Skyrim questions on ZT Rivia. Hello everyone, I'm Mitchell Waltz and welcome back to ZT Rivia, everyone's favorite trivia game show. I'm excited to start this season with today's topic of Skyrim, and our heroes taking on the quest today are Joe on my left and Cameron on my right. How well do you guys think you know Skyrim? Not at all. Not yeah. at all. Uh, yeah, not at all. It's been a while since I played, so, but I, I do recall a good amount of it. As long as these aren't like lore questions, I'll be fine. Alright, cool. Yeah, I haven't played really since the PlayStation 3 had it. So it's been a while. Well, I guess we'll just have to see, but before we start, I'll give everyone a short recap of the rules. We're playing three rounds with three questions that increase in difficulty as we play. But you also have to be quick because you only have 15 seconds to submit an answer. Now, can you Dragon Ball conquer this Tamriel trivia, or will these questions leave you feeling dizzy like you just had a couple vials of skooma? Well, there's only one way to find out, so let's just jump into it. Round one, question one. The Dragonborn was awakened to defeat Skyrim's ultimate draconic threat. What is their name? Do we have to spell it correctly? Yeah, please no. <laughs> if I just understand it. Or whoever gets the closest, if you guys both got it. Ah, there you go. That's cool. Okay. Yeah. All right, guys. Let's reveal our answers. We've got Alduin and Alduin. Oh, yes, you guys are both correct. Do we spell it the same way? Yeah, we spelled yeah. it the but same way. I got a castle. You guys uh, are you both play. correct in your spelling, yeah. too. Yeah, Very there's no apostrophes or anything like that in his name. So. Yeah, just a normal dragon name. For once. <laughs> I almost put uh, Macho Man Randy Savage. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Thomas the Tank Engine. <laughs> <laughs> Depending on what mods you have. Oh, man. Question two. Mages seeking knowledge can travel to the College of Winterhold, but what fields of magic can they study? I want them all, guys. Oh, I okay. I want them all. Just all of them in the game, or? All the, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Can I just say that these new boards are so nice. They really are. Yeah. They're not falling apart in my hand. I'm pretty proud of them. Nice and blue, they match. That's how I like, I got a clipboard to be official for you guys. Okay, I think I have all of them. How many schools are there? Can we at least know how many schools there are? Any hints? Nah. Okay. Oh, okay well. you got, are you guys confident in your answers? No. All right. Um, it'll be enough for me, I guess. Here, um, put a star next to my favorite. 
Okay, sure. Let's reveal the answers. Yeah. Cameron good. has. Oh uh, wait, no, I'm thinking. Of, I'm thinking of <laughs> D and D. Yeah. D with evocation. Evocation, illusion, arboration, abjuration, or, uh, abjuration. Yeah. Conjuration and necromancy. Yeah, conjuration's my favorite. I'm gonna Just... give you a big old nah. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's fair. <laughs> uh, we got destruction, illusion, yeah. restoration, conjuration, enchantment. Close, but nah. What the total? There are five. You yeah. guys both got five. Okay, correct. so there were five. The answers are destruction, yeah, uh-huh. alteration, alteration, uh, illusion, okay. conjuration, and restoration. Dang. But enchantment is like I'm a, gonna tell you, I don't know any <laughs> alteration spells. From I, I, I do telekinesis. I think um, isn't oh, doesn't alteration also fall under like necromancy? Like isn't that or is that part of restoration? Hey, That's transmutation. I'm, I'm telling you, it's the so schools. <laughs> In the college, that's oh the question. Gosh. No, no, I get that. <laughs> it's too complex. Oh, I can man. see enchantment though, because that is like a magical thing that yeah. you do. Yeah, I thought it was like a skill tree. I was just like, it is a skill tree. Yeah, one. so that's what I thought. But I don't think you can learn it in the college. Dang. Maybe somebody can help you out, like train you. But yeah, I know one of the librarians can teach you. Yeah. Question three: In Skyrim, the players can craft their own weapons and armor, but what is the best material they can use? Ooh. Does this include uh, the DLC? Mm, just say nah. Okay. Just give you like a B. Okay. I don't know why yeah. I put a little dot. All right. One. You guys both have answers. Are you guys yeah. confident? Yeah. Yes. All right. What's revealing? Dragon bone. Cameron says dragon bone. You say Daedric. Because Dragonbone's the second best. Oh no, it's Dragon Scale, isn't it? Dragon Scale, well, that's for heavy armor. They're mm. both the second best. But Dr- Daedric is like the best. Mm. Oh, right, because you can upgrade those higher than mm. these guys. I guess it is. But it's a little confusing when it comes to armor since yeah. there are different types. Yeah. But when it comes to weapons, Daedric's the best. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I couldn't remember if um, it was Dra- Dragonbone or Daedric. I thought Dragonbone was like a DLC. I always I hold on to my I, dragon bones, but I don't really think I know. I just sold a dragon bone armor. <laughs> I just never them. put them working. Yeah. I just I got lucky. I found a, a as a level one character. I found a danger bow in a chest. Oh really? Like, this is mine now forever. I'm an archer now. <laughs> Let's yeah. Go. Yeah, I just gave <coughs> gave all my dragon bones and skills to Lydia. Let her carry on. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm sworn to carry pounds. your burdens. <laughs> yeah. Round two, question one. Throughout the game, Skyrim is at war between the Imperial Legion and the Stormcloaks. But what are the names of their leaders? Oh my gosh, I know one. Oh, yeah. I only know one. <laughs> I figured you'd get one. I really had no interest in the war in Skyrim. I didn't either until I became a vampire and I needed some yeah. people to drink. So <laughs> I don't know, the, la- the last battle, it was kind of fun. Yeah, Especially if you put all your magic White into uh, destruction. Oh, and just Kamehameha. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's why I did Vampire, because I was like, you know what? <laughs> just, I just drank my way through the battlefield. The uh, soldiers didn't care. They were just like, yeah, Vampire on our side. Cool. Yeah. Who do you guys join? Uh, I, I did this, the Imperials. I did Imperials. Stormcloaks. Stormcloaks. The Stormcloaks are a little racist. Yeah, a little bit. A little against elves. I mean, so I amazing. joined them too, though, because they're blue, and I like the color. Blue. I like the Stormcloaks <laughs> because it's their home, and the Imperials are just like... We're taking this over now. That's true. They got like the underdog. And vibe. I was like, that's not right. <laughs> sure. They're like the Northmen to like the Lannister. Yeah, I don't Ooh. watch Game of Thrones. Oh, come on. <laughs> don't watch Game of Thrones. No. <laughs> Skyrim was supposed to be a Game of Thrones game. Yeah. I, I can see it. All right. Well, are we confident in our answers? Yeah, I only have one. I see yeah. one name. Let's reveal him. Ulfric Stormcloak. <laughs> Ulfric Stormcloak, correct. Yeah. Ulfric yeah. Stormcloak, correct. Prince. Vestuvius? <laughs> Vesuvius, like the mountain. No, okay. not at all. General Tullius, Tullius. Tullius. the imperial uh, leader. I thought he was just like, a general. I didn't know he was like. He the leader. Yeah. Cause wasn't there a quest where you had to kill like a prince or something? I don't know. I'm pretty there sure. There was you had a to... yeah. There was one that you could kill a prince um, during a royal wedding because it was during the um, assassins guild. Yeah. So that. I didn't think it was general. Yeah, the general. But it wasn't him that you had to kill. Someone else. Yeah. Oh, and then a king. It's all right. Question two: What platforms have Skyrim been released on? All of them. <laughs> yes, all of them. I want them all. Uh, I was just saying that's my answer. All of them. Yeah. All of them. Oh yeah. Citizen. PlayStation One. <laughs> PlayStation One. Yes. Can we write uh, Xbox Series X and PS Five? Because I guarantee it's gonna be on there too. Probably. If I had to guess. 
Yeah, this, this is going to be dated in a couple of months. Oh. Um, uh, I bought Skyrim four times. Same. For four different platforms. Same here. Uh, uh, we'll discuss on, how, yeah, on what platforms after this. Okay, I, I think I have them all. All right. <laughs> Let, let's reveal the answers to everybody. Cameron says Xbox 360, Switch, Alexa, PC, Not Alexa. <laughs> Xbox One, VR, PS3, PS4, Google, Wii, Wii U. All right. What is Google? I'm pretty sure it's the same thing as the Alexa. I wasn't sure which platform it was on. We'll get in. All right. PS, <laughs> PS3, PS4, <laughs> Xbox 360, Xbox One, PC, Switch, Wii. It looks like a Wii too. Yeah. And Oculus. All right. So neither of you are completely correct. I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different official platforms. I have eight. See, for VR, that came out on like PC, so it's not like an okay. official VR. I wasn't role. sure if you were counting that as a separate thing. Yeah, that's that's what I that's why I put Oculus because I thought yeah, it would be yeah. separate. So we'll get rid of the VR. And you <laughs> you only put Xbox 360, no Xbox One. Oh, you did put. Yeah, I did oh, put. sorry. What are you talking know. about? It, it just wasn't next to it. Yeah, right. I just was. I'll give the official answer. Okay. Let's Xbox see. 360, uh -huh. Xbox One, uh -huh. PS3, uh -huh. PS4, uh -huh. Nintendo Switch, uh -huh. PC, uh -huh. and Alexa. <laughs> I'm surprised you got did that. Did not come did, on Wii. I thought no it did. No Wii. Really? <laughs> wow. So I technically got it right. You did get it more right. You did include Alexa. Okay, but who? You put Wii as well. As, so I'm gonna I'm just gonna knock this off. I I will give the point to Cameron. Yeah. All right, all right, all right. Let's see how we're playing. Question three: <laughs> Where is the secret hideout for the Thieves Guild located? Mm. Be as specific as you like, because that might come into play. Okay. I didn't really do ever do much with the Thieves Guild. I know I finished it at least once and got like their cool armor. The skeleton key that so I'm pretty sure the skeleton yeah, key is like, I'm not turning this back in. It's this so good. Right now. <laughs> Sorry guys, this is mine. <laughs> I have become oh my a villain. God. What's the city? It's called. I'm oh. baffled, Joe. No, no, I, I remember now. I remember. I'm I'm pretty sure that's the name. I almost got it very wrong. <laughs> <laughs> almost felt right white run? No. <laughs> Solitude. <laughs> <laughs> the best place for me. <laughs> Alright, let's reveal the answers, guys. You both say Riften. Okay. You say in the tombs, in the sewers. I'm gonna give it to both of you. Because yeah. I'm not really sure what they are. They're it's sewers. It's down there. You can it's, hit a it's tomb called and it lets you in. The real answer, like the rat way, oh. is what it's called uh. underneath Riften. But I'll give it to both of you because they're kind of sewers, and I'm sure there's dead bodies down there. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> the big tombs, but okay. <laughs> no, the there's a, the reason I said tombs was But there's because, an entrance. Yeah, there's yeah. an entrance through the tombs, so yeah, I was like, that's go. probably it. <laughs> But they're not surrounded by tubes, they're surrounded by skeevers. <coughs> it's, it's okay. it's okay. it's okay. There's only giant skeevers, but it's okay. No, just ignore the skeevers. You're a giant skeever. <laughs> you are what you eat, so. <laughs> Look, I don't eat the skeevers. Some charred skeever. Hey, don't my favorite you try Your destruction <laughs> magic? No, it's cooked. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Nice and crispy. Can't even taste the disease. Round three, question one. What Easter egg is found at, the, at Skyrim's highest peak, the throat of the world? There is an Easter egg up there. I'll be very happy if you guys get that. <laughs> I have no clue. Uh, oh, 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 I know this one, actually. <laughs> of course. Yes. Um, it took me a second. Like, my mind had to go, like, to late 2009. Yeah. Or not 2009, because it came out 11, 11, 11. Like, 2011, Cameron. All right, you got to draw the picture yep. of the incorrect answer. Yeah, I'm not going to draw that. It looks He's trying bad. for bonus points. All right, let's reveal the answers. Joe says a pit boy, which would be pretty cool. I would, I would like to see that there. Yes, but the correct answer is Cameron's Notch pickaxe, a reference to Minecraft creator Notch. Oh, rip. It's pretty cool. That's like the throne of the world. Yeah, I, I think I, re I think I remember that now. Move the dragon out of the way. There's a pickaxe. Yeah. yeah. Question two: How many copies of Skyrim have been sold since its release in 2011? <laughs> Whoever gets closest, that's how it always is. Guys. Since its beginning. Oh. Since its my. beginning. Well, well, you can at least put four for me. <laughs> That's <laughs> at least. Yeah, I, not four for me. Yeah, there you yeah. Go. So we're up to I eight. I think like three or four <coughs> for me. Yeah, I bought Xbox 360, Xbox One, PC, and PC again because I bought the normal and then the, <laughs> the legendary yeah. edition. Yeah. Bought it twice. I love fighting your act, dude. That's so good. Just pushing him off, like. Yeah. And so he just goes, "Oh, you fight me!" <laughs> just launch him off. All right, I. 
You guys both have answers? Yes. All right, let's reveal them. Cameron says oh. 200 million. I said 80 million. Joe says 80 million. Game of the decade. <laughs> the correct answer. I wish it was 200 million, but it's actually only 30 million copies. Wow. That's a lot Which of... is surprising over so many platforms. I thought yeah, that's kind of not good. I mean, I don't know how much other video games. Let's sell. see how many Witcher have sold, because like. Yeah, it was good. I feel. I like... know how many awards the Witcher has won. I mean, who knows? I could be wrong. I was wrong about Naruto. Yeah, yeah, you were very wrong. That's very. I was off by like a year. Yeah. All right, guys, we're here. Question three, the final question of this ZT Rivia episode. What are all the playable races in Skyrim? Oh. oh okay. Okay. And also your favorite. <laughs> Well, I mean, the one you like to play most. Not, there's no favorites. No, there's favorite. <laughs> also, their birthplace. Oh, no. No, no, no. no, no. <laughs> Get out of <laughs> I mean, uh, Man, I'm getting really oh, mixed I'm... up on the official ones and the modded ones that I put in. Because <laughs> I almost wrote skeleton. <laughs> uh, yeah. I'm having a blank. I'm having a blank, just like in Gorgio. In <laughs> Gorgio. Enlarge, reduce. Yes. The same D and D. All right, let's reveal the answers. We got Cameron. <laughs> Nord. I couldn't think of it. We, we got Nord, Argonian, Khajiit, High Elf, Argonians. Imperial, <laughs> Elf, and Elf. Skyrimers. <laughs> Joe says Imperial, Dark Elf, Wood Elf, Breton, Red Guard, High Elf, I've Khajiit, and Skyrimers. Sky you forgot the Argonians. I did. All right. I forgot about the lizard people. Let's give the complete. <laughs> We have Nord, uh -huh. Breton, Redguard, yeah. Imperial, Orc, Khajiit, Argonian, Wood Elf, oh, yeah, High about Elf, orcs. and Dark Elf. There's ten total, guys. I've... High Wood Elf, Elf, High Elf, and Dark Elf are three elves. Yeah, I couldn't remember yeah, that. I knew there were three elves. I just Is it like... your favorite, the Dark Elf? No, I like the High Elf. Because oh, the of High Elf. Magic regeneration. Oh, yeah. Well, all right, everybody. That's all the trivia I have for you today. I guess I got to congratulate both of you for... Tying this, the only guy who's got two points. So. <laughs> yeah. well, it's all right. Well, you just have to rematch sometime. Yeah. I look forward to it. But how did you guys do against Skyrim Trivia? Let me know how many you got right, and if you have any more suggestions for future topics or questions, find me on Twitter at ZTVGoofingOff, and be sure to use the hashtag ZTRivia. Until next time, everybody, see you later. And who stole my sweet roll? Was it you? Go Caleb, please, I have the funny thing. We have to do the funny. Okay, um, go ahead. Okay, okay, okay. If you like what you see here on Goofing Off, be sure to like us on Facebook, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and follow us on Twitter. Hello everyone and welcome back to a new episode of Lights, Camera, Akron. Happy Halloween everyone and welcome back to a new episode of Lights, Camera, Akron. Happy Thanksgiving everyone and welcome back to a new episode of Lights, Camera, Akron. Hey guys, it's Kelly Stanley here reporting for Lights, Camera, Akron. Hello everyone, my name is Caleb Morgan and I'm with Lights, Camera, Akron. Hey LCA fans, this is Michael Macon with Lights, Camera, Akron. Reporting from Quaker Square, I'm Aquan James with ZTV's Lights, Camera, Akron. Thanks for watching Lights, Camera, Akron. Hello and welcome to another episode of 300 Seconds of Science. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Hey there, scientists. And welcome to 30 Seconds of Science. Hey, science lovers. Welcome back to another 300 Seconds of Science. Hi, science lovers. What is up, fellow wanderers? Watch 300 Seconds of Science on 45-1 and follow their social media accounts at ZTV 300 Seconds of Science. Now go out, enjoy life, and stay curious. You're watching ZTV. Well, Becca, good news for you, Chief. Cameron is talking about D&D this semester on his new segment, Dungeon Delver. Wait, this isn't esports? Um, yeah, D&D time, Becca. What? Um, yeah, well, here's Cameron talking about character creation up next. <laughs> Hello everyone, my name's Cameron Blen, and welcome to the first episode of Dungeon Delvers, where I talk about all things Dungeons and Dragons. This includes adventure modules, new source books, Unearthed Arcana, and so much more. But before we go into all of that, 
I think we need to start somewhere a little simpler. Simpler being put mildly, of course. So today, I'll be breaking down the process of character creation. First things first, you'll need to talk to your dungeon master on what rules they'll be using for character creation. These rules include how you level up, if you roll for your health or just go with the average, and how they'll be getting your ability scores. For leveling up, the DM can choose to go with experience points or milestones. Experience points makes it more or less a grind fest, while milestones allows the DM to choose the pace. When it comes to HP, fixed allows you an average number with no outrageous numbers in the positive or the negative. But with rolled HP, you may have a very high health pool at any point, or in some scenarios, you roll a bunch of ones and are easy to beat up. And when it comes to your ability scores, some DMs like to allow you to roll for your scores, or use a standard point array, or even use the point buy system. For brevity's sake, moving forward, we will go with experience points for leveling up, fixed HP, and a standard array for ability scores. This way, I don't have to keep re-explaining what these numbers all mean in the future. After that discussion, you get to choose your race. There are dozens to choose from. These can be a human, goblin, elf, dwarf, or an orc for those classic and iconic fantasy races, or you can go a little out there with a turtle, furball, changeling, or a bugbear. All of these races have natural-born abilities, giving them unique and fun ways to play. For example, the turtle race have natural armor in the form of their shell, as well as getting claws to use in combat, and are able to hold their breath up to one hour. The downside is that these guys can't wear armor due to their shell. Now, for most races, they have what are called sub-races. One of the most notable are the elves and the tieflings. They come in all sorts of different forms and each have different powers and abilities. So be creative and have fun. After picking your race, you then get to choose your class. As of recording, there are 14 classes available. These classes all have special ways of working in the world and have subclasses to help specialize even further. These classes are Artificer, Barbarian, Bard, Bloodhunter, Cleric, Druid, Fighter, Monk, Paladin, Ranger, Rogue, Sorcerer, Warlock, and Wizard. Each class has specialties too that makes them even more useful in certain scenarios. This means that the Wizard will be the one figuring out the riddles of the Sphinx while the Fighter guards them from the endless horde of the undead coming their way. But after you choose your class, you pick your proficiencies and any subclass that comes with it. Then we get to your ability scores. There are six scores that determine what characteristics your character has. Strength, Dexterity, Constitution, Intelligence, Wisdom, and Charisma. What do these all mean? Well, Strength is how strong you are, Dexterity is your reflexes, Constitution is how healthy you are and are able to resist diseases. These are your physical stats. Then we get to your mental stats, starting with Intelligence, which is how smart you are and how well you can remember things. Wisdom is street smarts as well as knowing how nature works. And finally, Charisma. It is how well you can speak and how commanding of a personality you have. This one is often misunderstood in almost every game. People usually associate it with good looks. Now, you can have a high charisma and be good looking. The two just aren't directly connected. Generally, when choosing what stats should be highest, it all depends on your class. Each class needs at least one score to be high to be effective. For example, the Wizard, Artificer, and Bloodhunter class all use intelligence for their spell casting. So generally, you want those stats to be the highest. Granted, the Artificer and Bloodhunter are hand-to-hand -hand combatants, so they might have intelligence as their second highest stat, so their strength or dex can be the highest if they plan to use weapons more than magic. After ability scores, you choose a background. This is to add tools, extra skills to your list, as well as adding some flavor to your character. After you pick the appropriate equipment for your class, you are all set and the game really begins. Out of combat can be basically anything, to insulting town guards, bribing a bard to sing songs about you, or convincing a shopkeep that you're their long lost child and that you demand years of missed allowances right this second. But when it comes to combat, there are four things you can do. Movement, action, bonus action, and reaction. Reactions occur on others' turns while the other three happen on yours. Each round of combat occurs in six seconds, so keep that in mind when casting a spell that has a time limit or a casting time. There are tons of scenarios and different ways to play, but that pretty much covers the basics of what you need to know to get started. So grab some snacks, a couple of friends, and nag that one guy who knows how to DM to run a game for you and have fun. But I wanna know what class you guys like to play the most, or what race you, is your personal favorite. Why don't you let me know by tweeting me at ZTVGoofingOff and be sure you use that hashtag DungeonDelver. And until next time, I'll see you guys later. Well, Becca, I think that's all we have for this episode of Goofing Off. How does it feel to come back as host? You know, Caleb, it's it's been pretty good. 
I've been gone for a while, so coming back to the old weird green place with the Goof logo is kind of refreshing in a way. That's really good to hear. I'm, I'm really stoked for what we have in store for this semester. Same. Well, remember to like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter and Instagram, and subscribe to our YouTube channel for extra content. Until next time, I'm Becca Tyler. And I'm Caleb Morgan. Thank you for taking the time to goof off with us. Uh, Hyoka. Kyle's probably making fun of me. Hyoka on, Hanama, on Animaga. Okay, like, that's fine. Kyle <laughs> would never make fun of anyone. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, buddy. <laughs> Hi. So my process was I started laughing, and I was like, maybe that could be crying. <laughs> Caleb. Babu Frick. Caleb. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, game's on a budget? I haven't heard that name since- Since Drew did it like a million years ago. Yeah. Who's doing it now? Well, according to my notes that I have in my hand right here that I think <laughs> it's- <laughs> <laughs> Guys, I'm so sorry. Hyoka? Duh, Becca. Yoka. Of course, Becca. Hyoka. I know. <laughs> be like, according to my notes in my hand. According to my notes. Yeah, I did that. Okay, 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 okay. okay. All right, 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 all right. Yeah. All right, guys, I'm just gonna Fortnite dance for you guys real quick. All right, all right, here we go. All right, thank you for watching, subscribe. This program was produced by ZTV at the University of Akron. Do you want to gain experience in video production, professional social media, or working with real clients? Visit the UA School of Communications online or follow us on social media to learn more. ZTV, make media, make a difference.